In a strange way, he felt that the city belonged to him, for he seemed its only claimant at this hour. Perhaps he should have felt fearful of the ghosts and spirits of the night, which his mother often spoke of, or of the far more real threat of a shadow ready to leap upon him from a dark alleyway, to steal his padded cotton vest, even his tunic and trousers. He certainly had nothing else upon him worth stealing. But he was not afraid. Perhaps it was good for him, his new life at the Hanaza. He was outgrowing the fearful, stumbling child he had been. Thanks to Kinshi, he was gaining a confidence in himself that he had never had before. Despite his mother's curse, he would become an honor to his father's name. In time, his father would be proud of him. In time, he hastened his steps. Was his father really sick? Why hadn't he been to the theater these two months? Surely his anger at the boy had not kept him away. Yoshida was to blame. That must be it. Yoshida was saving money by using only the old puppets. Why should he care if Hanji and Isako starved? His own belly was full. May he spend eternity as a foot manipulator for the devil. That had been his mother's curse on Yoshida. Jiro almost smiled. It was really worse than the one she had issued him. The house was dark and closely shuttered. He went around to the side and vaulted the gate that hung between the side of his house and that of the next-door neighbor. Then he put his head close to the shutters of the back room where his parents would be sleeping. "'Father!' he said as loudly as he dared. "'Father, it's Jiro!' He waited, but no reply came. He rapped on the shutters with his knuckles. "'Father, wake up! It's me, Jiro!' There was a sound from inside. Who? a male voice, not father's, asked. Jiro, Hanji's son, who are you? As if in reply, he heard the steps across the mat floor. The person had slipped on kitchen clogs. Jiro could hear the scraping across the stones, and then the kitchen door shoved aside. And finally, there was a crack in the night shutter. Jiro ran to the opening. Jiro? What are you doing here in the middle of the night? It was Taro, the son of the neighbor, Sano. He pushed the shutter aside and stepped back. Come in. Where are my parents, Taro? They didn't tell you? Your father was sick, and your mother told took him to your cousin's farm near Kyoto. I'm just guarding the house while they're gone. Is my father, is my father very sick, Taro? I don't know. She said it was his lungs and that he, the country air would be better. More food there too, maybe. My father had a friend heading down that way with a cart, so your father had a ride most of the way. I see. He was spitting, he said. A little pink, but not really too bad. A bit of rest and good food and he'll be his old self. That's what he said to my father. You mean his lungs were bleeding? Not really that bad, just a little pink when he spit. I think, you know how it is. Jiro nodded in the darkness. Well, thanks for your help. That's nothing at all. I'd offer you something to drink, but... No, no, I can't stay. I must be back well before dawn. He started out the door. If you hear anything from my parents, I'd like to know. I'm at the Hanaza. Sure, I know, replied Taro. Your mother told me. I'll come right up if there's any news. Go in health. Yes, thank you. And you. The darkness no longer seemed friendly. It was cold and damp, and the moon gave less light than it had before. He broke into a run and was back under his quilt at the Hnaza long before Mochito came in to snatch it off. Although Yoshida regarded himself as a specialist of the female puppet, he occasionally chose to operate the male lead. As Kinchi explained it, in a play like The Battles of Koksinga, when Yoshida did the male lead of the warrior, Watanei, he was on the stage almost the whole time. Because of the elaborateness of the sets, Yoshida made the further decision not to alternate this play with a domestic tragedy, as he sometimes did. 
but to offer this single production as long as there was a profit at the box office. Jiro was glad, for all his excitement, that his initial appearance on stage came early in the play. He crouched behind the wooden apron and held the stick so that his giant clam rested just at stage level, as Kinchi had carefully coached him to. Soon Kinchi, his cloth snipe held high above his bent back, came bouncing on stage, the wings of the bird flapping. He circled around a bit, then turned the bird's head downward, as though sighting the giant clam, and swooped greedily down toward its open shell. Jiro yanked his string and snap! He had the poor bird's long beak firmly, so or so the audience thought, imprisoned. Kinshi flapped his bird's wings and struggled mightily. Okada recited the tale as the warrior Watane and his wife Kamutsu, walking along the beach, happened upon this scene of two creatures determined to devour each other. Watane turned. Jiro carefully watched the turn. What was it about the feet that he had not discovered? Ah, that was it. The right foot. The height of the right foot. He had kept it lower, hadn't he? And it moved like a dance step, the rhythm exactly matching that of the samisen. Next time, he thought, he would be able to do it to Machito's satisfaction. Kinshi was right. Whenever one was on the stage, he had to be alert. There were secrets ripe for stealing for any apprentice who kept his senses awake. After Wantanay's long discourse on the parable of the clam and the snipe, like two warring nations destroying each other and laying themselves open to attack from a third powerful force, Kamutsu took her long tortoise shell hairpin and pried open the clam shell, freeing the snipe. Toodaloo, Kinchi whispered as he sailed his flap winged snipe away. But Jiro never changed his expression. Somewhere, Yoshida's piercing black eyes were watching from under his hood. You shouldn't fool around on stage, Kinshi. Suppose Yoshida were to hear one of your dreadful toodaloos. What would he do? Nothing that he hasn't done before, I'm sure. But it wasn't the snipe's farewell that eventually got Kinshi in trouble. It was, a, it was a case of stomach grip that came upon the foot operator, Kawada, one afternoon during the middle of the third act. He manfully completed the scene, but it was obvious to everyone that if he should be forced to continue, he might bring disaster upon the performance. There is no help for it, Yoshida snapped. Yoshida Kinshi will have to do the feat for the rest of the performance. He's a fool, but he knows the text and what and what I expect. None of the other boys has ever worked with me, and the other operators already have their assignments. Are you nervous, Kinshi? Jiro couldn't help but ask. Kinshi stuck out his bottom lip and shrugged. Good luck. Kinshi gave a half grin and pulled his hood over his head. Jiro had to take over Kinshi's one-man puppets in the scenes calling for soldiers. And when he wasn't on stage, he stood beside Teiji at the left-hand curtain. He was ill with anxiety. He elbowed Teiji and whispered, Kinshi's doing all right, isn't he? As far as I c c can tell, that was the problem. How is Yoshida regarding it? The three of them, Yoshida, Mochida, and Kinshi, were to be breathing as one at this moment. Was it possible for Kinshi to work so closely with his father? It seemed to be. L looks fine, Teiji whispered encouragingly. Jiro nodded. Oh, help him, help him, he prayed to Ebisu or any god who might happen to be listening. Finally, the last battle was fought, and the victorious Watane stamped from the stage to the cheers and loud cries of approval from the audience. Okada raised the script and bowed for the first for the final time. The performance was over. Mochita pulled off his hood. As he passed Jiro, he was smiling. Jiro pounced on Kinchi. You did it! You did it! Kinchi smiled. 
If only you were my master, what an easy life I'd lead. It was nearly midnight by the time the boys had cleared up after the evening meal and cleaned the theater for the next day's performance. We ought to have something to celebrate, suggested Jiro. Something to toast Kinshi's triumph today. What do you suggest, Mr. Toastmaster? asked Wada sarcastically. The charcoal is quite dead. We can't even boil water. I know, said Kinshi suddenly, where I can get some sake. He went to the door and stuck his head into the hallway. Everyone seems to be asleep, he said in a loud whisper. I'll be right back, and he let himself out. Kinshi, no, Jiro called, but the senior boy had already gone. He's the world's number one fool. Wada shook his head, half in judgment and half in wonderment. The world's number one fool returned shortly with a jug of what all the boys agreed was the empire's number one wine. Kinshi even persuaded the reluctant Wada to join the lantern-lit revels, and they all laughed as a tea teacup full of the potent sake raced down Minoru's throat like water into a rain bell. Ah, the little big pig had choked upon it. Watching Minoru's red face, the tears streaming down, Jiro sipped his own cupful very slowly and studied the happy scene. Even shy Teiji was smiling broadly, and as for Kinchi, Jiro had never seen him look so at ease. It was not just the wine. Kinchi had faced a rigorous examination on stage today, and he had passed. Did Yoshida give you a word of praise tonight? he asked. Yoshida? A bull would soon give milk. B -b 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 bulls Teiji began. I think, said the voice from the doorway, that is exactly what he means. They all looked up in alarm. Yoshida, Jiro breathed. Somehow the invitation to this party failed to reach me. He leaned over and picked up the nearly empty jug. To show you that I am not offended, Mr. Kinchi, I invite you to my room at your earliest convenience. He ducked his head in a mock bow. I am sure the rest of you are tired after your busy day. He picked up the lamp and blew it out. The four of them stayed frozen in position while Kinchi stumbled across their quilt in the darkness. They listened to him walk down the hall until the door of his father's dressing room slid shut behind him. Jiro lay rigid, straining to hear the sounds from Yoshida's dressing room. The paper door and distance muffled all but a low murmur, and then the talk ceased. It was replaced by a rhythmic thwack, 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 thwack. He winced each time. It was his fault for having suggested a tote. Toast, but it was Kinchi who was being beaten. It was not fair. Yoshida should have punished them all. He turned over and tried to shut up the sound. Oh, Kinchi, I am sorry. I am sorry. At last, Kinchi returned and got under his own quilt. He was greeted with absolute silence, which meant that all the boys were lying tensely awake, waiting. Kinchi, Jiro whispered at last, forgive me. It was nothing, came the tight reply.